Hello, everyone. Welcome to virtual workshop uh, hosted by CUNY Graduate Center, uh, Initiative for Theoretical Sciences. Um, I am Sogi Zhang. I have been running uh, virtual workshops on quantum mass equations this semester, uh, along with Eitan Geba at University of Michigan. Um, this is the second of these workshop series, and the topic today is um, consistent theories beyond phenomenological or perturbation methods. Uh, we have four speakers lined up um, from around the world. One quick announce, the third speaker, Sujana Hilga, uh, wasn't able to make it because of important doctor's appointment that cannot be canceled. Uh, but instead, uh, Martin Plania from the same institution will speak. And uh, one quick information about the workshop. Um, each speaker will have uh, 30 minutes, including questions and answers. And we will allow about five minutes for quick uh, questions and answers. Please submit your questions to the chat uh, to all people. Then. We will now uh, ask questions for you at the end of the talk, or give you time to ask questions uh, if you have a sufficient time. And another important thing is that at the end of all the formal talks, there will be informal discussion sessions. You can ask more questions and participate in important discussions. So don't go away. Uh, with that, uh, I am happy to introduce our first speaker, David Reichman from Columbia University. Uh, David, please go ahead. Thanks, thanks, Sugju. So I'd like to thank Eitan and Sugju for organizing this uh, virtual workshop. And uh, the work that I'm gonna tell you about today is uh, uh, doesn't contain any published results, but there are two archive preprints uh, uh about the subject and the work i should say was done by my uh current graduate student uh pj robinson and a former graduate student uh ian dunn so because this uh um workshop is about master equations i thought i would start with master equations uh even though uh what i'll tell you about seems less connected to master equations, it's actually quite connected. Um, so I think many people in the audience know that you, there's a standard way to use projection operators and write down an exact equation of motion for either a quantum operator, or in this case, the reduced density matrix of a system, let's say coupled to a bath, uh, and it takes this form, which is known as the Nakajima's Wanzig form, uh, which explicitly exhibits the fact that um, systems uh, interacting with a bath, in this case, contain memory induced by these interactions. And this K is called the memory function. We'll hear a lot about it today, I'm sure. And it, um, it needs to be computed exactly if your method is going to be exact. And that's where all the difficulty lies. Um, there's also another form of an exact equation of motion for, in this case, the reduced density operator, uh, which I would call the Tokuyama Mori form, uh, which uh, looks different in that you notice the operator in question here is at the same time that the time derivative is taken. So it's local in time, whereas this is non-local in time because this tau runs from zero to t. So all the times previous to that. However, both of these equations are exact if k and phi are computed exactly. Um, there is a interesting fact that I think is maybe underappreciated that each of these equations are a different resummation of various types of cumulants. So this equation, of course, is sort of a generalization of the Kubo theory for line shapes uh, in classical stochastic processes. And not surprisingly then, it resums operator terms that have Gaussian-like uh, cumulant properties. So for example, the standard cumulant, we know we take a four-point uh, correlation function and uh, it can decompose into uh, three different possible pairings 
uh, with different time orderings. So if the, if the um, quantity in question is Gaussian, this term would vanish and we would be left with just the Kubo theory. There's a similar cluster property for um, the nakajima zwanzig case, but it, it contains only time, uh, completely time-ordered uh, decompositions. And in, in fact, actually, if we took a problem like the Kubo line shape theory, this, this uh, term would vanish under a different statistical property, which is that the fluctuations of the random modulation of the oscillator are sudden jump statistics instead of Gaussian statistics. Okay, so there are you know, situations obviously then where if you're going to do something perturbative, it's better to use this form. And there are other cases where it's better to use this form and it's not always clear which is the best thing to do. So a very obvious example that no one would solve in the way that I'm showing you is to take a problem like this because the system Hamiltonian here commutes with the system bath Hamiltonian, no one would solve this by master equations. You would immediately know to just use a cumulant expansion and that the second order cumulant, if this is Gaussianly distributed, would give you the exact answer. But you could go through, uh, so this is just a quantum version of Kubo's line shape theory. Um, if you solve the master equation, you'll get a very simple form, which you can solve exactly because it closes for this matrix element, this off diagonal matrix element, whose solution is just the Kubo form. And when you calculate the line shape in that model, you get some progression of vibronic peaks. The interesting thing is if you were to solve this in a, you know, if you were not very well educated and you solve this with the Nakajima's Wanzig form, at second order, this uh, uh, intensity of the optical absorption in this case would be wrong. That is, it wouldn't have the right number of peaks, their spectral intensity would be wrong, uh, and uh, it's possible that even the placement of the peaks may be incorrect. So this would be an example where the exact solution is given by going to second order in the time local theory, and you would need to go to infinite order uh, in the Nakajima's Wanzig form to get the exact theory, but of course there are situations where the inverse is true. Now, there is an analog of this dichotomy, the schism between time local and time non-local in uh, field theoretic approaches. The standard thing that we teach our students when we do uh, Feynman diagram resummations is uh, the self-energy approach. So the one particle Green's function, which I'll define later as a function of wave vector and frequency uh, has a simple algebraic form in, in the frequency domain with a self-energy here. Uh, and this self-energy is the analog of the memory function. So if I go back to this equation, I can also solve this equation in Fourier Laplace space and get a similar looking relationship. Okay, so, uh, and, and there's, you know, a host of methods uh, that you one can use to try to actually calculate more and more accurately the self-energy. That's something that I'll discuss later. There is an analogous approach, which is in the literature often used, but less systematically developed, which is what's called the link cluster or cumulant Green's function approach. So this is a time domain approach where you solve or you make an ansatz that the Green's function, uh, the one particle Green's function basically has an exponential resummation of perturbative terms, okay? This approach has been used in a lot of areas of condensed matter and computational condensed matter uh, physics for over 50 years. In fact, the earliest application of this I know are papers from the early 1960s uh, by Brout, who won the Nobel Prize for uh, the Higgs boson, doing this in imaginary time for partition functions. Uh, and they called it the link cluster expansion. There are papers that are 51 years old from Langrith that do this for electron phonon problems. And then in the electronic structure community and the GW community, this has been used hundreds of times to more accurately calculate the spectral function, especially at low values of the wave vector near the bottom of a band to give the satellite peaks that are measured in let's say X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, and the way that that's done is one takes the self energy that's calculated in that theory and just exponentiates it. So it's a non-systematic way of doing the calculation. 
but it, it can be quite effective in comparison to experiment. So let me make this point uh, by looking at a variety of examples in the literature that do this sort of cumulant approach. Uh, in the upper right here, I show some recent work by my colleague Tim Berkelbach, Garnet Chan, Steve Louie, and their co-workers, which compared the calculation of the spectral function, which again, I haven't defined, but is really just um, the kind of spectroscopy that would be measured in, in X-ray spectroscopy um, using uh, coupled cluster methods for the electron gas compared with the standard GW approaches, which are the red and um, uh, uh, blue lines here. Okay, so this curve and this dash curve compared to a cumulant version of this, which is again, I say I take the GW theory at lowest order and I just basically exponentiate it. And one thing that you see is something that's very common, which is that um, these satellite peaks in the spectrum for k equals zero in this case um, are, have different spacings depending on how the calculation is done. And in particular, it's known that the GW theory usually only gives one satellite peak and it places it too far away from the main quasi-particle peak. So it's something like one and a half times the um, frequency of the density oscillations of the electron gas, but it's known that this satellite peak, the first one should be at one frequency unit of the density oscillations of the um, uh, electron gas, okay? And I, I we'll see when we talk about electron phonon problems, this is sort of like the phonon frequency. And you see the same thing happen in more realistic versions that the cumulant gives uh, um, results that give better experimental agreement and GW sort of places a weaker peak further out in the spectrum. There are many other recent applications also to electron phonon problems and other kinds of problems. Uh, again, the argument is often made that it's more accurate to use uh, the cumulant theory, but this accuracy is judged by comparison to experiment and not by comparison to uh, model calculation. So the motivations and goals that I'll try to go through for the next 15 minutes are to give a systematic test of the accuracy of uh, cumulant-based methods, and then to do something that I think is long overdue, and it's not, we're not the first to suggest doing this, but I think we may be the first to carry it out, which is when we think about methods we use in uh, many body theory that are based on the self-energy and the Dyson equation, we often, and it's part of the title of this workshop, we don't are not satisfied to just stick with perturbation theory, right? Uh, we want to make the approximation self-consistent. And there's a very clean and clear way to do this within the Dyson expansion, which is that all uh, non-interacting Green's functions in this expansion of the self-energy are converted to interacting Green's functions and the equation is solved self-consistently. So Hartree-Fock theory is such a, uh, theory where you keep the bare Coulomb interaction and you renormalize the, the uh, non-interacting Green's function to the interacting one. GW is a similar thing. Uh, now the expansion is in the screened Coulomb interaction and you can renormalize the G knots in the self-energy. Um, there's the self-consistent T matrix. There's the beta saltpeter approach. All of these can be made self-consistent and uh, that often, but not always improves the accuracy of the approach. So these are the goals. We want to turn this uh, cumulant approach into a self-consistent one and see how well it does. But we also want to test the standard perturbative uh, cumulant approach. And so to do that, we're going to look at a um, model of a single electron on a one-dimensional lattice, which is a simple version of the Holstein model. So basically, the electron can hop from one site to another on a lattice. The lattice will have periodic boundary conditions. I don't necessarily choose the number of sites to be uh, large, and I don't necessarily take the thermodynamic limit. That will help me assess um, the uh, accuracy of the method. Uh, I have a bath of phonons. For most of the talk, I will assume that the, there's only a single frequency uh, in that bath, but when I want to treat more realistic cases, I can take a dispersed uh, band of frequencies. And I have a very simple coupling that's local to the uh, coordinate of the, um, of the bath mode 
uh, and the density of electrons on that site. So when the electron is present on site I, it causes a contraction or an expansion of the phonon frequency of the molecule sitting on that site only. Okay, despite the simplicity of this uh, system, and it's simple in several ways, this is not the full Holstein model. The full Holstein model has an arbitrary concentration of electrons. I'm working in the infinite dilution limit. So there's one electron on my lattice. This greatly simplifies the problem. If I have many electrons on the lattice, they actually interact with each other through the phonon bath. And this is the kind of thing that is um, you know, uh, useful when we teach superconductivity. There's a very simple way to see how you get an effective attraction between the electrons from the phonons from this model, but I'm excluding all of these effects and taking a single electron on the lattice. This is relevant for experiments in the infinite dilution limit. As I mentioned before, the quantity that I'm gonna study is the one particle Green's function. This is the one particle Green's function uh, at zero temperature, but it's very easy to generalize this to finite temperature. I just have a thermal trace in the infinite dilution limit that thermal trace is, is particularly simple. I only need the non-interacting um, density matrix here. That's not true when I have N electrons on the lattice. Um, and so this is really looks then like a correlation function of the um, raising operator uh, and the lowering operator of a given energy or wave vector. Another way you can think about it is it's just the autocorrelation function of a state where I inject a single electron. And the quantity that is experimentally measured is the uh, one particle spectral function, which is just basically the imaginary part of this function in frequency space. And this is directly connected to what's uh, measured in Engel resolve photo emission. Now I should say, and it's important for the remaining uh, 10 minutes, that um, there are a variety of methods, uh, some of them quite new, to solve this model exactly. Um, the method that I'm going to rely on most are not our own results. These are results of Banca, uh, and th this uses a variational exact diagonalization approach. Because of the nature of the approach, the number of sites in the model is restricted to no more than something like 10 or 12. As I'll tell you, however, that's not, uh, that doesn't actually uh, alter the picture that one gets from uh, the solutions. There are more perhaps advanced, but somewhat less flexible schemes that have been invented in the last several years. Um, sorry about that. So uh, for example, my group has developed a method called the generalized Green's function cluster expansion method. This works in the infinite lattice limit and it's exact upon convergence. There is a more recent approach which uses the uh, hierarchical equation of motion method in k-space, which seems quite useful as it gets rid of several problems with HEOM in the position um, space domain, uh, which uh, is something that actually Ian Dunn, who's contributed to this work, worked on previously, and which Shang-Chi has done some very, very nice work to remove these kinds of instabilities. It actually turns out that it looks like this method, this case space HEOM is very closely related to our method, but we haven't investigated this clearly. There are also recent combinations of variational exact diagonalization with DMRG. So this is results from 2020 by Heidrich Meissner and, and Banka. Uh, this is a comparison, an unpublished comparison of our method at finite temperature with the variational exact diagonalization plus DMRG method. And you see there are things to still consider. These are both supposed to be exact methods, um, but they're not exactly the same. And I suspect that our method is closer to the exact answer in that I suspect that the extra sharpness you see in our results is because when you use the MRG for these kinds of problems, you have to do them in the time domain. And this means that it's natural to have a finite time cutoff which broadens the spectrum somewhat, although you see that these things are very, very close. Um, but in the end, I'm not gonna use any of these fancy methods. I'm just gonna compare with the exact diagonalization. Um, and so first, what I want to do uh, is look at uh, low order cumulant expansion methods. So that basically what I do is I just take the self energy of the um, Holstein model, which is just a 
phonon correlation function times G naught, and I basically exponentiate it. That's the way that these cumulant expansions work, or I, I just write down the perturbation expansion to order G squared, and I exponentiate it and write it out in that form that I showed you that G is equal in the time domain is equal to G naught times an exponential function, and I calculate that function rigorously in perturbation theory to second order. So what I'm comparing here on the left is the spectral function. This is the Fourier trans, the imaginary part of the Fourier transform of that one particle Green's function in frequency space at wave vector equals zero. So if I have the band structure of the um, Holstein model, it looks like you know co a cosine, and at the bottom of the band is where I'm measuring the spectral function, and I'm comparing this in you know, the, the sort of peaks that you see in black and the black lines with uh, yellow shading are from these exact results. Now, one thing that you notice in these exact results is there's a lot of structure, uh, which you never see in the cumulant expansion result, but this is definitively from finite lattice effects. So I'm only using six sites. If you use 12 sites in the exact results, these get a little less um, prominent and you can show that the only features that are different between a 12 site lattice and an infinite site lattice is that this becomes a smooth band. And you, what you see is actually that the cumulant expansion seems to do very, very well uh, in getting the main structure of the peaks, including secondary peaks. Um, it doesn't capture these finite size effects, but that's not so bad as they're pretty artificial. Um, and if you try to carry out the cumulant expansion to fourth order to see if you can capture some of the structure that you miss, what you find is you do do a better job in some cases. So the dashed red curve here is the fourth order cumulant expansion, but the results are pretty similar and they come with a host of problems. And these problems have been noticed in the literature before. Things like negative spectral weight, which you can sort of see here, the, the spectrum goes negative, which is not allowed. This arises in the fourth order cumulant expansion. And also the actual theory itself can be unstable. And so that's why we only can compare these results at high temperature um, uh, where the, the, um, the method is stable. So this points out a problem with the cumulant expansion. This has been noted before. It's been noted in the chemical physics literature when line shape theories are calculated using cumulant expansions. There's a nice paper from 1994 by Medden, Gunnarsson and Sontheimer, which also uh, discusses this negative spectral weight problem. So basically one of the takeaway messages is don't, don't try to do the cumulant expansion above second order. It's not worth the effort. The other thing is if you look at overall wave vectors, you see that while the cumulant expansion looks quite accurate, uh, at um, k equals zero, it looks much less accurate away from k equals zero. So this is a heat map of the entire spectral, spectral function. So I, this curve here is just a cut at k equals zero. And that's what these lines are. This is the entire spectrum for all k. And what, when you compare it to the exact result, you see that while you can capture these um, satellite peaks, um, in the spectrum, it occurs for the wrong reason. It occurs for sort of a crossing structure that never exists in the real spectrum. And I'll show you on the next slide what the result of that is. And away from k equals zero, sort of a k equals pi or minus pi, you miss peak splitting that's quite prominent. And that exists in the thermodynamic limit. So this is the example of what things look like in the thermodynamic limit. Um, and you see that there are this very, this very prominent structure of satellite peaks, which you miss completely in the cumulant expansion and the curvature of the um, effect around K equals zero has the wrong shape qualitatively. Okay, so what we want to now, I'll finish the talk with is thinking about how to expand uh, our palette of the ability to do these methods by making the approach self-consistent. Um, this is not as obvious as how you do this in a cumulant expansion uh, method, but there are ways. Let me give you a heuristic way, which is actually motivated by something interesting, which I won't discuss in the theory of turbulence. If we take the Dyson equation in the time domain, it looks very much like the nakajima zwanzig master equation I wrote out, where the self-energy is like the memory function. This is my exact equation of motion for the one particle Green's function. And this is the lowest order theory for the self-energy. 
I can note that this D naught I can write in the following way. Then I can replace all the G naughts in the theory with G and I'm left with an equation, a very nonlinear equation, which is self-consistent for G. This kind of equation can be derived in a much more rigorous way, which is in our paper. It was suggested first by Dennis Dunn, not Ian Dunn in 1975, but he never actually implemented it. So we can implement this for our Holstein model. Again, this is an extremely weak coupling actually. G is like one over 30, just to see the structure of the solution for a finite size system. And you see that for K equals zero, there's no real utility in doing this self-consistent procedure. You do start to see this negative spectral weight problem, which comes from um, the time domain behavior exceeding the bounds of one and minus one, but the quasi-particle peak is well described. But if you go to K equals pi, so at the edge of the band, then there is a prominent peak splitting that you can never capture with the cumulant expansion perturbatively. So even though the coupling strength is exceedingly small, you just average over these. And the, in the time domain, these are recurrences in the spectral function that the self-consistent method gets perfectly, but you never capture at low orders in perturbation theory. We've applied this in the thermodynamic limit to calculate the spectral function in the Holstein model. And you see a great improvement at intermediate coupling uh, compared to the exact result, which is the middle panel. The self-consistent result is somewhat over-coherent actually. And I should point out that for the, to, to get these results, we have instabilities at long time. We don't know if those are completely numeric uh, or if they are, um, you know, the fact that this equation is very, very nonlinear and difficult to integrate. Um, but qualitatively, we see a great improvement. Let's say around k equals zero, the curvature of the, sat the first satellite band is correct. Uh, the effective masses are better. The number of satellite peaks is better. One of the other things that's quite interesting is that um, these instabilities and, uh, and numerical problems are much easier to deal with when the model is more realistic. So remember I mentioned that my Holstein model has just a non-dispersed phonon band. However, we can study models with dispersion like you always have in a real material and that actually tames and stabilizes the solution of this nonlinear equation. So in the center I show a model where there is a narrow dispersion of the phonon spectrum. These are exact diagonalization results again provided to us by uh, Banka. Uh, this is the cumulant expansion result and you see many of the problems I showed you before which is too smooth and unstructured um, uh, uh, um, spectra away from k equals zero. There's a gap that opens in the spectrum which is not present in the cumulant expansion. This is the self-consistent result, which looks much, much more like the exact result. The gap opens, this structure in the, in the um, spectral function away from k equals zero is captured. These little white regions are regions of negative spectral weight. They're very small. You can see where they are here when I take slices. This is at k equals zero. This is at k equals pi over two, and this is at k equals pi. Uh, but you see that the structure overall of the spectrum the spectral intensity, the fact that you get multiple peaks in the right place. These are only things you can capture self in the self-consistent cumulant theory. They never arise at low order and perturbation theory uh, in the standard approach. So I think I've run out of time. I'd like to conclude just with the main points that, uh, that I think are interesting. <clears throat> the standard second order cumulant uh, theory is reliable, but only at k equals zero. And even there, it appears that you know, our systematic study is the first to show that this seems to work for the wrong reasons. Um, going to higher orders can slightly improve the location of the peaks, but it comes at the expense of potential instabilities in the actual approach, which obviates the approach completely or can lead to negative spectral weight of, as others have pointed out. We've been able to develop a self-consistent approach that is much more promising, but some of these issues still remain and we, are actively investigating um, you know, to what degree they remain in realistic problems. Uh, and you know, I think the most interesting and uh, exciting uh, aspect of this will be lies in the future, which will be testing um, this approach, even on models like the electron gas, where the cumulant expansion has been shown to agree very well with experiments, 
um, but these methods are not self-consistent. So if you want to model real systems, those methods depend on the input of what uh, non-interacting Green's function uh, you have. And as you noticed before, when I showed the results of uh, Louis, Berkelbach, and Chan, depending on whether you start in an electronic structure method with a Hartree-Fock genot or a density functional genot, the results are different because the method is not self-consistent. So it'd be nice to have a self-consistent method, which works very well. Self-consistent GW actually makes the spectrum worse. So we would like to know whether self-consistent cumulant theory actually makes the um, results better, but also preserves the uniqueness of the result. And with that, I'd conclude and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one minute for questions and answers. There is one question in the chat by James Chen. Uh, the question is for the Polaron model, whether mm -hmm. it can be extended to two or three dimensions. And yeah, also for vice versa, when you have two or three particles, whether they can be uh, converted to two or three one-dimensional cases. Yeah, so let me answer. There are two separate questions. One is there's no problem with this method uh, in doing higher dimensional uh, models or realistic models. Everything I've tested is one dimensional because the exact results are in one dimension, but it's actually quite simple. It's actually simpler to do the cumulative expansion in higher dimensions than, than uh, models that work in, free, in the frequency domain because the Fourier transform of the non-interacting Green's function is not known analytically in more than one dimension. So it becomes a numerical problem, but it's doable. Um, so that answers the first question. There's no issue with that. And we do plan to look at realistic problems uh, like the electron gas and more realistic with this. So that's not an issue. Um, it is an issue for some of the exact methods. They become more expensive or they, they have other problems, but in principle, they're also doable. So for example, DMRG is difficult to do in higher dimensions. Um, for, the higher, for the more electrons on the lattice, um, the only thing that changes in our theory is that the, um, the D naught here becomes a D. When you have one electron on the lattice, this function is always D naught. It's just a phonon, uh, non-interacting phonon correlation function, but one needs to generalize this when you have N electrons on the lattice. This is also true in any many body theory as well. So in GW theory, this is the W and the W becomes a function of the Green's function as well. Uh, and that would happen as well, but that's not hard to deal with. It, 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 does, it isn't true that it becomes N one dimensional problems. Okay, thank you, David. Our second speaker is Tibra Sigal from University of Toronto. Thank you. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Thanks a lot uh, for the organization. Uh, very nice uh, set of meetings. So the title of my talk is the Reaction Coordinate Quantum Master Equation, and I will talk about applications to non-equilibrium transport. So as you can see from the illustrations below, unlike the previous talk, which was uh, oriented towards uh, lattices, uh, my talk will be, um, as you can see, more impurity models. But in fact, the emphasis of my talk is not going to be so much to describe uh, these little machines, but more to try to understand better what the reaction coordinate method offers to us. Yeah, so it's really us using these models, these simple models, or not so simple, to understand better the method rather than the method to uh, look at the models. So uh, these two models, as you can see, maybe very briefly, one of them, uh, the, these lines at the center are supposed to be our quantum system, whether it's a qubit or a three-level system. And then we have um, two or more heat bath. So the types of problems that we are looking at are non-equilibrium steady state in the sense of um, heat, uh, as you can see from the left side, the uh, heat coming from the hot bath crossing to the right side through the quantum system. Um, and the picture here at the right side corresponds to what we call an absorption refrigerator. I will see if, we'll see if we get to that, but very briefly, the idea here is to use a quantum system and extract energy from a cold bath and dump it into a hot bath. And of course, this can be realized only if you add energy to the system and here it comes in the form of an additional heat bath. So we, uh, these two models were, of course, examined extensively in the literature in different contexts. And here again, the idea was to um, use them with the study them with the reaction coordinate, get gain new insight and all, on the models and on the method. So just um, very briefly on the history of the method, 
I'm really not doing here justice, but I wanted to make sure to clarify, of course, we were, the method has been around for a long time. Um, I guess since the mid eighties or so, um, at least the first paper I found around the, the mid eighties from Garg, uh, Michael Toth, uh, Bugart, and these papers were in the context of quantum dynamics or let's say reaction dynamics, where the idea is that let's say charge transport between a donor and an acceptor, of course, coupled to an environment, we strongly coupled to an environment. And the, the questions of course has been how to treat this strong coupling to the surrounding environment. So this is, uh, I guess, the original context, and that's where the name came from, the reaction coordinate. More recently, in the last, let's say, seven or so years, uh, there has been a lot of activity and extensions, so adaptation of this method in the area of quantum transport, as you can see from my examples, and maybe QT is also quantum thermodynamics, and uh, several names, hopefully in the audience, Hassan Nazir, Gernot Schaller, Philip Strasberg, and more recently, Latoon and Korea, and we have learned a lot from uh, this literature. So let me thank the students uh, who actually worked, did the work on this project. Nick at the left side, a graduate student in my group, and Felix, an undergraduate student who also contributed uh, yeah, significantly to um, two projects in this uh, field. Okay, so we'll see how far we go. <laughs> um, the motivation, I will begin with your motivation. Um, the strength or the reason why we play with this reaction coordinate technique is because we would like to be able to capture strong system math coupling effects in whether dynamics or transport, as I mentioned. So I will give a little bit of a motivation on that. Um, I will move on to the method. So um, as I've already said, it's a reaction coordinate mapping, quantum master equation. So there are two parts to this uh, title. I will uh, briefly uh, introduce the reaction coordinate mapping, which is exact. So that's, uh, uh, again, the first step is uh, fully exact. And the next part of it, which is a quantum, the actual quantum master equations that uh, we have been using, this is of course approximate. Um, so putting them together brings the question of, of course, the title of this workshop. I don't remember it exactly, whether it's self-consistent or can we go beyond them? Um, uh, can we do here a consistent perturbation theory? What exactly do we capture with such a method? Um, so I will try to address uh, these questions. Um, and the examples that uh, I will provide you, so it from the first slide uh, along the line of the spin boson model, we have played with uh, the normal one and then the generalized one and uh, yeah, an example of quantum thermal machines. Last, uh, I will not uh, get to that, uh, with Nick, we have been recently working more on the analytical side, trying to see, um, yeah, more from the method itself, from the how, what exactly is included, again, in line of the title of this uh, workshop, um, but this is still in progress, so hopefully it will be on the archive at a certain point. So back to the motivation on, obviously, open quantum systems, that's what we have, we are all here for. Um, so the type of setup is a system, that's what I have at the center, and as I've said, in the context of my work, I'm looking at non-equilibrium non steady state problems, so the system is coupled to multiple environments, let's say two metals, and maybe also substrate phonons, electromagnetic field, and so on. So the types of questions that uh, people would ask are, yeah, the dissipative dynamics of transport, let's say, from one metal to the other, mediated through the system. So when I uh, talk about strong coupling, uh, of course, I mean the interaction between the quantum system, let's say electron jumping between a donor and acceptor to the surrounding environment. Uh, so a few examples, uh, uh, we're trying to uh, convince you that uh, these uh, bold arrows that I put here to indicate strong coupling are actually a, um, a relevant experimental challenge, not just uh, for us in theory. So I just brought examples from my own research, but of course it's everywhere. There are many, many great studies. Uh, so we have been looking at charge transport through uh, molecules that are bridging metals. So that's an example from an experimental work together with the group of Owen at the Weizmann Institute. So these are two pieces of metal and in between them, they trap a, here a very small molecule, hydrogen actually, hydrogen molecule. And they study charge transport, noise, and so on. Many interesting questions uh, one can ask. But the point is that, okay, so this molecule is a system that I illustrated here, and you have here the two metals. The coupling is strong uh, based on modeling and many studies that have been done in the, for, on these types of systems. 
uh, yeah, this Boldero was are indeed very bold. Uh, so um, you cannot ignore the effect of the environment on the system. It's not a perturbative effect. Uh, it really changes the whole properties of the transport problem. Uh, if you treat it as a weak coupling, you don't get the correct results. And you may wonder, well, maybe here this is a situation because the molecule is so short. So maybe that's why you have to take into account the, this interaction uh, carefully. But in fact, even if you go to longer systems, let's say uh, protein or other biological molecules, let's say maybe 10 base pairs and so on, still the interaction with this environment here in metal is uh, central to the process, even in, for such a uh, length, as has been again uh, discussed in the literature. And here, as you can, you can convince yourself that this is a case because, of course, the electron enters the system from the metal. So treating this coupling properly uh, is quite important. Now, another context for my work, at least for the strong coupling literature, a uh, strong coupling ambition is, uh, I already mentioned, quantum thermal machines. Um, so I already mentioned we have this three-level system, and it's going to act like a refrigerator for us, or a working medium for a refrigerator. Um, so this model was introduced many years ago, as you can see here, I just made a nicer illustration. And the beauty of this model is, and that's why it is so attractive, even though experimentally uh, it's not uh, trivial, the beauty is that you can analyze it uh, with weak coupling techniques, and I will say immediately what do I mean by weak coupling, but you, you can analyze it and gain analytical expressions to help you understand the performance of this machine. For example, here the main question that you would ask is, how do you have to tune the parameters of these three levels? For example, the splittings. So these are these theta, theta cold, theta warm, and theta hot are the splittings. So the question would be, how do you have to tune it so as the system would act as a refrigerator? And this is a cooling condition that one can very easily gain from a simple quantum master equation uh, telling you that, yeah, you have to tune the splitting to be small enough, and then the system would act as a refrigerator. But this expression was derived based on recoupling technique and the immediate question is what happens if in the experiment you are coupled strongly, is it still valid? Um, does it still give us something meaningful? Uh, okay, here I just put an example from a theoretical proposal at least uh, to realize such a system. Okay, so just to mention what do I mean by recoupling because uh, yeah, you can think about it in different ways. In the context of my work, it's going to be thinking about the bone mark of Redville Redfield quantum master equation. So we are thinking about a system or oh, the total Hamiltonian made of HS for the system. Yeah, that was my, uh, what I en encircled before. And then I have the bath, as we have said, it could be collection of different environments with different degrees of freedom. And V is yeah, just, a, again, could be sum of different couplings between the system and the bath. So I'm um, here I just wrote the uh, quantum Liouville equation, and this should be approximate here, just to mention, uh, yeah, with a set of very standard approximations, a uh, weak coupling, uh, Markovian assumption, initial factorized condition, also leaving out the first term in this expansion, assuming it's, its thermal average is zero, you get this uh, equation for the reduced density matrix. So when I refer to weak coupling limit, I'm referring to results uh, uh, obtained from uh, this type of uh, equation. Uh, generalized maybe to have more than one environment. And I mention it because one could also, there are parallel studies uh, in the literature where, where people directly look at the steady state with, or the equilibrium state and compare them and again do perturbative expansion uh, to this expression. But I'm going to focus on the top part of my uh, slide where this is going to be my reference point. So usually in our studies, what we would do, we would, uh, for example, in the context of reaction coordinate, we will perform simulations with the reaction coordinate and compare them to what we get with this, uh, with this recoupling technique. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that strong coupling uh, is uh, important in the context of uh, the problems that we study. And let me now briefly tell you about the method itself. I used, I took these uh, illustrations and equations from a very nice, um, I guess it's a review or a tutorial type uh, paper from um, a massive book on uh, quantum thermodynamics. So what do we have here? Um, the purplish uh, circle is supposed to be our system. And these are, let's say, um, harmonic bosonic degrees of freedom. So the green stuff is supposed to be the bath. Uh, you can see here the collection of harmonic oscillators, frequency omega. And then we have a system operator S coupled to these degrees of freedom. 
we characterize the interaction of the system with the bath with the uh, spectral density function, and here it's denoted by naught. So the sense of the reaction coordinate method is that we just do an exact transformation on the bath. And with this exact transformation, as you can see, we go from this light blue to the dark blue. And if you count how many circles you have on the top, you have, oh, I guess, eight. And in the bottom, you have uh, seven and additional one here. So it's really just to change the connectivity of the bath. So as now we have, um, again, the original system. But here is we extracted one degree of freedom from the bath. So the creation annihilation operators now are small b with a frequency omega. Yeah, here it is. Um, and the coupling parameter from this yeah, extracted coordinate lambda and the rest of the bath is here with us. So the way to think about it is that what we did was an exact uh, transformation, but now we can treat this uh, um, yeah, two components as the extended system coupled to the rest. And the rest, again, we can, uh, one can calculate instead of the gamma naught, which characterize the coupling to the original bath. Now we have gamma one, which characterize how the extended system is coupled to the bath. So I should just tell you what are these lambda and omega. Yeah, there is an exact mapping. Um, so we get this new coupling parameter, a new frequency. Of course, everything is encoded in the original gamma naught. If you know, given the spectral density function of the original mode, of the original picture, um, you get all the new parameters and this is given in these formulas. Um, so there is a yeah, simple way to get uh, all these expressions. Now, why is the method so promising, so interesting? Without getting to the details, what one can show is that um, if the, even if gamma naught is such that the coupling is strong between the original system and the bath, gamma one can be made uh, very weak, where the strongest of the coupling is actually uh, captured by this lambda. So you can continue and increase the coupling here with the gamma naught, and it's going to be, <laughs> um, supported by the uh, actually enhancement of lambda rather than the gamma one. So this tells you that what you can do is indeed treat this as an extended system. And it's okay to have large lambda within the extended system. We are going to treat it all uh, properly. But since the coupling to the rest of the degrees of freedom is weak, this gives us the opportunity to use a weak coupling technique, or as I mentioned before, something like the redfield born markov redfield quantum master equation, where this is our new system and the rest is the bath. So that's the essence of the method. Um, and I described uh, or introduced it in the context of a system coupled to one bath. And in our work, obviously we extended it to include, uh, let's say two reaction coordinates when we are coupled to two distinct baths. And uh, with the study of the um, absorption refrigerator, again, here we used the, we extracted two degrees of freedom, yeah, two uh, reaction coordinates. So, okay, this seems a small uh, extension, just to, instead of one reaction coordinate, we have two. Um, and as I've told you already at the beginning, one important motivation for here has been not just to study the models, but study the method. As you can see, it's not a simple, it's not a perturbative approach. Now that we included the, this degree of freedom in the system, it is treated, um, which maybe I can say exactly, uh, as part of the system with coherences, everything included, but the rest is now perturbative. So it's not, you, you don't have a clear expansion yeah, in order by order of what is included and what is not. And um, to better understand what is here, that's why we played uh, with these uh, different models. So, okay, so let's uh, actually talk about some examples that will help us understand uh, what is going on. So the first model is, uh, uh, we've heard about it uh, last month by uh, Chan Shu Chao also. Um, just the non-equilibrium spin boson model where we have um, just a qubit, a spin with let's say splitting delta and coupled to heat bath. And I made these bold arrows to indicate that I'm going to think about strong coupling situations. And we are going to use a reaction coordinate technique. And uh, this work was summarized here and see what we get. So I'm, I just summarized here actually the steps because it was a quite a detailed uh, <clears throat> uh, process. And I hope uh, by that I will convince you already that there is uh, quite some interesting aspects of the method beyond just uh, throw it on the computer and get results. So what we did was to perform the reaction coordinate mapping that I told you about, and we extract harmonic oscillators, one for each uh, contact. And then, okay, we have to truncate these uh, harmonic oscillators, obviously, because we cannot uh, 
computationally treat the full dimensional uh, manifold. Another step, you can read more in, the, uh, in this new journal of physics, we diagonalize the extended system. Now there are two options. Either you throw it on the computer, so that would be the numerical route, just uh, do your best. Uh, and then the analytical route, which I also uh, would like today to spend a little bit of time and talk about it, because uh, I think this is a part of the reaction coordinate which wasn't uh, well explored before. And it turns out that you can actually gain a lot uh, from the method to understand more the nature of strong coupling. So what one can do is, after this set of processes, after this uh, few steps, um, why in the justification you can read more here, we can truncate the eventual spectrum of the extended system, and we leave only the lowest two states. Yeah, so from the original qubit, after a couple of steps, couple of transformations, we end up with new uh, qubit. And this, uh, so the, we have new splitting and we have new couplings. And actually we have also new spectral density function and we get them all analytically. Now we can write down the Hamiltonian and we have this delta and we have this coupling. And this means that what we can now do, um, oftentimes uh, we have analytical expressions approximate, yeah? We can use them with these new parameters. Yeah? So we have now renormalized parameters that already capture a lot of the strong coupling effects. Um, and we can use a low order theory with the new parameters. Um, and um, and uh, this could give you actually quite an accurate, quite accurate results as we found out. So this is what I will uh, quickly tell you. Yeah, starting from the standard non-equilibrium uh, spin boson Hamiltonian, let's ignore the first term. The splitting would be delta and then coupled to, okay, here I use C for the um, bosonic degrees of freedom. Uh, here they are, the two heat bath. And the spectral density function without elaborating on it too much, we use this Brownian spectral function, which is picked around a frequency big omega and the coupling strength is lambda. And we use the same model for the two contacts. So this dense, spectral density function is illustrated here by a bold line. So this is a regional model, which we would like to use to study the uh, steady state heat transport through the system. How much heat can the system support uh, going from left to, from the hot side to the cold? So after these uh, um, steps that I mentioned uh, very briefly, the reaction coordinate mapping and diagonalization and truncation and back and forth, uh, we end up, as I've said, with an effective model. And here you can see it's really just back to the spin boson Hamiltonian. And we have an analytical expression for this um, new splitting and the new coupling parameter. And with that, one can continue and study the heat current uh, with, with a low order method. That's the power of this technique. So let me show you quickly the results. This is a heat current as a function of lambda. And let's say you do the recoupling theory that I mentioned at the very beginning, just straight off the born markov redfield that's a dashed line. Recoupling theory tells you, well, if you stick me stronger, that's better, yeah? I can support more heat to flow through the system. Now just focus please on the full line, on the solid line and the uh, blue one. And these are, uh, one of them is the numerical approach, which is just the, the uh, reaction coordinate quantum master equation, but uh, using an, it on the computer. And the other one is the, where is it? Uh, the, what we call effective spin boson model, where we have had these renormalized levels, and then we have had an analytical expression to actually calculate the heat current. So as you can see, we capture here the, um, the turnover of the heat current, which without getting to the details, if you attended last month's talk, it's a signature of the Polaron effect. So obviously the method, the reaction coordinate technique here, uh, captures this uh, polar on physics, which is indeed uh, what we are now trying to do more uh, carefully. So that's one message for this method. Um, we do capture this um, strong coupling effects uh, as, done, as we see in the polar on physics. And the next part, which I guess I have only about five minutes, I will mention more briefly, um, inspired by this study by um, Genji and Shu Chao, where they looked at a variant of the non equilibrium spin boson model. Uh, we were very curious to see if the reaction coordinate technique can capture it. Again, the objective was a method rather than a model. And what is interesting about the model suggested here is that you can indeed see the orders um, in the perturbation the uh, series for the current. You can see the contribution of the lambda square term and you can see the lambda fourth term and so on. So we wanted to see if the technique, the reaction coordinate technique can capture it numerically and analytically. And the results again were surprisingly um, good. Uh, well, uh, yeah, please, if you are interested, take a look at this archive paper 
uh, the method, very cheap, um, very easy, can capture what originally was done with the hierarchical equations of motion. Um, so yeah, just to show the power of, you add one degree of freedom into your system. Uh, if you add it properly, correctly, um, you can uh, get results uh, comparable to very massive techniques. Um, so finally, I will just give you a taste of the last project, um, the uh, quantum absorption refrigerator. I already mentioned that the beauty of this method model is that there are analytical expressions for the, let's say the cooling window and other, yeah, the efficiency, the max power efficiency and so on. And all those derivations were based on the weak coupling technique. Uh, and the question is uh, whether it's uh, proper, whether it's correct. So with this paper that was recently published in uh, Fizz Revue with uh, Felix and Nick, uh, we, the main contribution here indeed was to the numerical one. Um, here uh, we just implemented the technique, the reaction coordinate quantum master equation method as I've uh, detailed it on, the, uh, on this model. Computation could be quite massive. Okay, I will not go over all the details. Um, the main question that we asked is what happens to the cooling window? So the, I'm showing here the cooling window for the, using the Born Markov Redfield technique. And as you can see, this is, okay, when it's colorful, it means good, it's cooling. The system acts as a refrigerator. So as you can see, only for relative low frequencies, yeah, when this theta cold is small, you are able to cool. And if we go uh, bottom to top, as you can see, when we increase lambda, uh, the cooling performance increases. But of course, we know that we cannot rely on this observation, on this prediction, because the method is no longer valid in this regime. So we use the reaction coordinate technique, and this is a cooling window, the colorful region that we found. Now, it depends. Uh, some people are always optimistic about strong coupling. They say, yeah, it's going to be great. You're going to find a new performance, and then there is a negative approach. So depending on your flavor, if you go here, you go up, you realize, well, strong coupling means suppression of cooling. If you walk here, you realize, well, strong coupling means a new regime for cooling. And the true answer is, of course, that there is just reshaping of the cooling window. And the beauty is that we can capture it again with this renormalized energy levels that we get because of the reaction coordinate. Yeah, repetitive, repetitive transformation and diagonalization and truncation that we did, uh, one can show that it's really just uh, the same cooling condition, but with new energy levels. So with that, let me conclude. Um, I think what I uh, would like to emphasize maybe didn't come uh, through, but there are no conceptual issues here to define currents, especially heat current. So when you are at strong coupling, if you use other, other techniques, this is often a problem, how to, where to calculate the heat current, uh, how to define it. Well, with this reaction coordinate quantum master equation technique, you don't have this issue because the dissipation happens uh, yeah, if, uh, at the boundary and it's a weak coupling technique at the very boundary so there is no issue here and that's a huge uh, uh, relief. Um, other advantage of the method is its flexibility. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily cheap because uh, as the system size grows, yeah this is a redfield type uh, approach for the extended system so you have the scaling with the power of four but it's very flexible so changing the type of your system whether it's a chain whether it's yeah multi-level system of a different uh, geometry, uh, it's very easy in this technique. And finally, what I tried to hint is that one can get analytical results here telling you what strong coupling actually does, whether it's renormalized level, whether it opens new transport pathways. Yeah, all those you can see them uh, with this reaction coordinate technique. So yeah, finally, again, I would like to thank the members of the group and yeah, pro pro provide here the list of papers for those who are interested. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have four minutes for questions and answers. Uh, Eitan Geba asks two questions. The first is how to extend this method for an harmonic path. Now another is how to parameter parameterize this Hamiltonian for real systems. And James uh, um, and also David Reichman asks a question about how this is compared with the variational polar transformation approach. And James Chen asks a um, question about how we can actually distinguish the strong coupling uh, from the weak coupling. Okay. Okay. So I will try to remember, I will start with Ethan about the unharmonic bath. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Ethan. I don't think we can do it. Uh, the basic mapping is based on a normal mode transformation. 
um, yeah, it goes at the very back, back to the technique. One can think about parallels to do, maybe there are some ways to do transformations, but uh, yeah. My question not... actually included a comment about, let's say the solvation shell, the first solvation shell is going to be your reaction coordinate basically, and then it is weakly coupled to the rest of the solvent, in the liquid solution. And here to your sense? Uh, yeah, so then the rest to be, Oh, well, but, but these degrees of freedom came from the original ones, which were harmonic. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, the original one are harmonic, it's not consistent to somehow add later on. So for that, I don't have a solution for uh, parameterizing. I guess it's uh, the same approach that you would use for other techniques with parameterization. If um, you find them, just throw them in, into this technique. And then the parameters go through the reaction coordinate transformation. Um, that's fine. Okay. Um, Can you also address question by David Reichman about comparison with the variational polarity? Yeah. So um, we didn't compare it. Um, I can show you this result. At least it's not the variational polaron, but the full line is a related method. It's a polaron transform. Okay, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's actually the same, no. So we don't have an example where we compared it one to one. Here it's a polaron transform and non equilibrium Green's function technique that was developed by my former postdoc. I should have put here a reference. Um, so which one, as you showed in your graph, when good techniques disagree, it's not clear which one is actually the winner. So similarly here, um, so we, yeah, we don't have uh, the uh, answer. Uh, to that, we couldn't, one aspect that I should mention in the comparison, here we are using Brownian spectral function for the original model because the reaction coordinate mapping is, um, is easy to be performed with this type of method. So this actually gives us some troubles when just taking results from the literature because we have to make sure that the spectral density function is the same. So that's where there's always a little bit of a gap in uh, making comparisons. Okay, another short question by Ashan Nezer. Um, is heat defined with respect to the residual bath rather than the original bath in Antonia? So we didn't get the question, but there was before that maybe if I could answer, mm -hmm. how do we make do the comparison with weak to strong coupling? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so here the comparison is done at the numerical level. Yeah. Um, we, we just uh, separately calculate with the lower order technique, we get say the dashed line. And once our technique gives us something else, um, yeah, we know that would be for us a deviation. And again, one can see it also in the equations, um, what the reaction coordinate gives you. Uh, we can see the renormalized levels, we can see the new transport pathways. Uh, so one can see it actually. So sorry, the last question, I didn't get what it was uh, for my son. Yeah, hit, uh, is hit defined with respect to the residual path? rather than the original bad Hamiltonian. How do you define the heat? Oh, the when heat it makes a transformation, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah, I didn't mention the calculation of the heat current. So let's take a look maybe here. Um, oh, I'm trying to find, okay, let's do it here. So the, the coupling of this degree of, of the last, yeah, a degree of freedom, the new degree of freedom to the heat bath is weak. And when we write down a quantum master equation, we have the term with the dissipators, so that's where we, okay, so I didn't write here the expressions, but the standard uh, analysis of energy conservation would give us the amount of energy that is given from the system to each heat bath. It's encoded in the dissipators. Um, so that's uh, what we are going, what we denote as a heat current. Okay. It's really between yeah. the system and the bath at these lines. <laughs> Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Uh, Yura, why don't you stop sharing your presentation? Uh, for the second half, Eitan Geba will be uh, the host. Eitan, why don't you step in? Let me move to the background then. Okay, so the next speaker, if you can share screen. Okay, so next speaker is Martin Eplenio from the Institute of Theoretical Physics uh, in Ulm University. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, first have to send my apologies for, well, rather Susanna's apologies. Um, she, on very short notice, she could not um, present the lecture and she asked me to stand in. 
And um, so I'll do my best. I have just come from a quantum gravity conference, actually, so which just finished. So I'll, I'll see what I uh, that I I hope that I will be um, comprehensible here. So the, the lecture will be about numerical system environment interaction for quantum biological systems. And um, okay, the slides don't move. Uh, no, okay, and um, the the interest. Uh, in, this, in this entire topic of developing these methods actually stems from our interest in the, in the relevance of quantum effects in biological systems themselves. And uh, for that, um, we have to basically go from very large machines to very, very small machines, protein sized, where electronic degrees of freedom will interact with the vibrational background. And uh, we have to describe this interaction reasonably well in order to test our theories that we may have. And really the, 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 the noise that is uh, originating in these systems um, is, is really coming from the fact that we will have electronic, kind of an electronic network made out of molecular sites that are held together by a protein manifold. And of course, this protein will move and, and, and jiggle around and, and um, experience motion in its thermal background because biology, ha biology happens at uh, room temperature. And as a consequence, this will change ever so slightly the um, electromagnetic environment of the of the of the sites here of the where the electronic excitations are living on. And uh, it will change the excitation energy, and therefore it will lead to a change in the accumulated phase, and therefore it tends to lead to dephasing. And uh, because this is a mechanical structure that's, that's vibrating, it will, of course, have um, a certain frequency spectrum. It will not, will not have arbitrarily high frequencies, it will not have arbitrarily low frequencies. And there might be specific resonances which correspond to the eigenfrequencies of this, man, uh, of this uh, mechanical thresh, uh, um, um, net, uh, um, network. And um, as a consequence, the spectral density that encodes the, the frequencies that we have and their coupling strength to the electronic system will not be just flat. Uh, it will actually have considerable structure. And that's the first reason why we typically we cannot assume that it is Markovian. Um, and the second reason is that when you look at a whole range of phenomena in, in, in these quantum effects in biological systems, you will typically find a situation where for very, very weak noise, the system performance is actually not optimal. And for very strong noise, when everything is classical or described by rate equations, it's also actually not optimal. So the optimal performance tends to be in a regime where we have um, intermediate strength coupling to the environment. And what does that mean? That means, roughly speaking, that each system component interacts with another system component with roughly the same strength that it is interacting with its environment. And that again is a situation where the system environment dynamics is really highly non-Markovian. And therefore we need, uh, we were interested at the time to develop methods that can actually treat this non-Markovian system environment interaction, which is also in a non-perturbative regime because the interaction is quite, actually quite strong. And we were keen to do this in a manner that is in principle, um, well, it should be numerically tractable, of course, but also it should allow us to increase the degree of precision at will. So we would like to have a handle, basically, that we can increase, and then our, uh, uh, our method gives a more precise answer to our um, um, computational problem. And in addition, at least in principle, we want to be able to give bounds on the error that we are committing so that we can actually take all the approximations that such a method might still involve and put them um, to, uh, into an analytical form and, and then be able to say, okay, the measurement result 
that we, and so the simulation result that we are getting is this one. And the true answer lies somewhere in this interval given by analytical bounds. And so that was the task we set ourselves uh, at the beginning. And um, so now I would like to explain to you the approach that we are taking. This is not the only approach that one can take, but this is kind of our favorite um, um, uh, way of, of thinking about these systems. And uh, to that end, let me take a very, very simple example system. It doesn't have to be that simple, but I would like to keep it simple to, to keep the explanations also moderately complicated only. So here we have two sides that may um, support an electronic excitation. And they are coupled to each other electronically. And then each of these sides will have a vibrational environment that will actually um, interact with the electronic degrees of freedom. Typically, this will be a dephasing type of interaction, although this is not really relevant for the method that we're presenting here. So for the following, I would assume that this environment here, this harmonic oscillator environment, well, these are harmonic oscillators, so they're not unharmonic. Um, there is an extension of this method to unharmonic systems, but then it uh, changes in various ways quite a bit. So we assume the environment is harmonic. We assume that the coupling is linear, so we have a system operator. Um, that is uh, coupled to the position of the harmonic oscillators. So that's basically the setting. And in such a manner, um, this is the standard setting that, that we can, uh, that, that is assumed for like spin boson model, for example. And we would like to actually transform this problem into a new form that will look simpler and will also have the advantage that once I have done this transformation, I can apply uh, the method of density matrix normalization group uh, or matrix product states to uh, the dynamics of this system. And in fact, uh, that I will be able to apply this method for really very long integration times as well. And so this is really the goal that I want to do. I want to find an exact mode transformation of these environmental modes here so that I actually, they are mapped onto a linear chain with nearest neighbor interaction only, okay? And once I have that, once I have this one dimensional structure, then this is very amenable to DMRG or TDMRG and matrix power state simulations. And so I would like to first start with actually explaining you how this transformation is done because it is actually really quite nice and simple because it uses and it's based on on the theory of orthogonal polynomials. And uh, so this sounds a little bit, uh, you know, having mathematical apparatus, but you will see that I need only two properties of that theory. And then I can actually show you, can prove to you that this transformation is possible. And so what we want to do is we want to find a transformation from a possibly um, continuous um, harmonic path to a set of discrete modes. Okay, and so this will be done by some unitary transformation that looks a little bit uh, funny. In one case, it has a continuous index, and in the other set, it has a discrete index. But I mean, in principle, it's it's uh, unitary. It's a mode transformation. And what I will start with is that I will make um, a simplification. I mean, I will make a particular split of this unitary into two parts. So there will be a function h of x, and that's simply the coupling strength that I've shown you before of a particular mode with the electronic degree of freedom. So that's my coupling function. And um, then I will have another part of this uh, transformation, which will actually happen to be in the end an orthonormal polynomial. Okay, so this splitting, I mean, this is not obvious that you that this is fruitful, but this is a key aspect of this method that I that I actually decompose this transformation here into the coupling strength and some other function that reflects then more the spectral density of the system. And so these polynomials, in order to ensure that this matrix is um, is um, unitary we have to actually have special property of these polynomial functions, namely 
they have to be orthonormal polynomials with respect to a particular integration measure, and that's the square of the coupling function um, as the integration weight, basically. Okay, so that's what we demand, and then we can see very easily immediately. So the integral, so that means the inner product of these unitary matrices with each other, integrated out over x, will actually indeed give a delta function between n and m, simply because we have demanded that these polynomial functions are mutually orthogonal with respect to this integration measure. So, so far we have not gained anything. We still have to determine these polynomials in the end. And I will show you in a moment how this is done. The other thing that we now have to remember is, and that's a wonderful, that's on book, that's in the first few pages of all books on orthonormal polynomials. And it's the fact that for any orthonormal polynomial with respect to any integration measure, they always satisfy this kind of um, recursion relation. That means x times the um, x times the polynomial n is actually a linear combination of three uh, orthonormal polynomials, namely the one of two of the n plus first, the nth, and the n minus first. And that is universally true. You know these relations from the Hamid polynomials, from Jacobi polynomials, all of those are examples of these orthonormal polynomials with respect to certain integration measure, and they all satisfy these recursion relations. And the other thing, the final thing is that the first orthonormal polynomial is always the polynomial, um, uh, the constant polynomial. So these are the things we need to remember, basically this property and this property, and then it becomes inevitable that this, poly, this transformation actually maps this harmonic path onto a linear chain. And to see that, um, so that's a full proof of it, and it fits on one page. So first we take the uh, coupling term here. So here you see this h of x, and now we make the mode transformation. And so we replace all the modes a of x by a sum of u n of x times b n. So that's what we get here, and that's great. So then um, we remember that the unitary is actually h of x times some polynomial. So then we have h squared here. That's good. That looks like the orthonormality relation for polynomials. And so the next step is that we introduce another orthonormal polynomial, namely the constant one. And so now we see here that this integral is actually uh, exactly the orthonormality relation between the nth polynomial and the zeros. And that means that we get a delta function here between n and zero, and therefore, we only couple the electronic degree of freedom now to the first or to the zeroth uh, element of these new modes. And now we have to look at the eigenenergies of the Hamiltonian. And we can see that here, if we replace again, we make the mode transformation, then we get actually each of these modes is uh, substituted. We get this unitary matrix here. But of course, we have here this function x. So, now we replace the unitaries again by h of x times the polynomial. So we get h squared. We get the two product of the two polynomials. And this looks almost good. But now, of course, we have this extra factor of x here, which is just the, the frequency of the, of the modes. And here, we have to use now the recursion relation uh, for orthonormal polynomials, namely x times p of pn of x, is just a linear combination of these three uh, orthonormal polynomials, namely the n's, the n plus first, and the n minus first. And therefore, we actually now get, again, by the orthogonality relation, we get now three terms here. We get the an eigenenergy term, we get a hopping term to the hot from n to n plus one, and from n plus one to n. And that is actually simply a chain with nearest neighbor interaction. And so this is already the proof that indeed this transformation is possible and we can use it then to make this system more amenable to, um, uh, to um, DMRG simulations. 
Now, in the end, one has to determine these orthonormal polynomials, and there are systematic methods for that. We don't have to do it ourselves. We can take ready-made programs from, the, from some uh, repository. So we typically use this one, OrthPol, which determines for us all the coupling coefficients in the chain and all the eigenenergies. So there's nothing we need to do very much about that. And now, um, of course, I would be lying if there was no additional approximation involved in here. And one fact is that I have made a transformation from the harmonic path to a linear chain that is infinitely long. And in numerical simulations, I cannot treat an infinitely long chain. So what I have to do instead is that I have to truncate it somehow um, in the chain length. And secondly, it is in certainly in DMRG is rather painful to treat infinite dimensional systems. That means harmonic oscillators. So in, in reality, what I will do is I will truncate the harmonic oscillator Hilbert space to a finite dimensional Hilbert space, maybe five dimensions, 10, 20, whatever is needed. But of course, this is an approximation and you may now ask uh, what effect this has on our ability to predict physical phenomena. So we have here an error budget. So it's a chain termination. It's a local Hilbert space bound. And the nice thing is that one can actually in both cases provide analytical upper bounds to the error that is committed. So I can tell you if I take this Hilbert space, um, uh, Hilbert space truncation, and this and that chain length, then I will commit the following error uh, in our, the, uh, I can bound the error on our system observables given a certain simulation time that I want to do. And I mean, okay, this does not look very nice. Um, here's the system observable. And here on the right-hand side is an upper bound. And this upper bound uh, will typically explode, explode for very long times. But for moderate uh, times of the time evolution, um, this is actually can be a rather stringent bound. And the bound will explode in simulation time when basically any perturbation that the system has exerted on the chain has had an opportunity to travel all the way to the end of the chain, bounce back, and come back and hit the system. And when this becomes this traveling out and bouncing back, when this becomes an appreciable contribution, then really this error bound starts to grow very rapidly. And uh, so that is something that we can always fix by making the chain longer. So in principle, we have, uh, we have control. So I said this already, we have control over all the errors. So we get a simulation result and we can also say, okay, the true results lies in the following interval around the simulation result. So we're still not um, completely um, done. Um, so we may also have some experimental uncertainty here. So someone might tell us, this is the spectral density that actually is prevalent in the system. Um, but this is experimentally determined. So there might be small errors. So this is not a problem of the method itself, but it might be the problem of the data that you are being given. And so it might be that the actual spectral density might be slightly different. So there might be a small error, delta j. And so then again, for the spin boson model, um, we can go through the entire analysis and now ask the question, if we have a certain error in the spectral density, what impact may this have? What error does this give us on the system observable that we want to predict? And again, one can derive using, in this case, path integral methods, one can derive upper bounds on the error that is committed in terms of the deviation um, of the, of, uh, in the spectral density that we are having. And again, this can, this will, for small times, this will be a very good uh, bound. And for long times, this will start to grow very rapidly. But in principle, um, we, can, we can at least give an analytical bound on the error that is committed. Okay, so this is uh, fine. Um, and the method initially, when we had formulated this method, it was always particularly efficient when, um, when we had low temperature environments. So zero temperature to be precise. And it became rather costly 
when we had finite temperature environment, simply because we had to move from the method of matrix polar states for the simulations to matrix polar operators, which um, need, uh, which squares the number of free variables that you basically have. And this is really um, um, an unfortunate situation. And initially, this was really preventing us from going to, to let's say, room temperature simulations, for example. Fortunately, in a, a rather recent development, we realized that we can actually map exactly without approximation the finite temperature problem to the zero temperature problem. Yeah? And that stems from the observation that actually the dynamics of the system is determined by basically the two point correlation function of the environment, because we are in the spin boson model here. And that means that the spin degree of freedoms, the, the dynamics, are uh, exactly determined by the knowledge of the two-point correlation function. So we can express that in terms of the spectral density. And at finite temperatures, this will take a form of the spectral density plus uh, some additional uh, terms, which depend on the mode population uh, of, the, of the population of the mode at frequency omega at temperature T. But now we can make a trick. So normally here one assumes that one only has positive frequencies. So we can extend the integration interval to negative frequencies and then rewrite this very same expression in the following form. And we will find that it looks exactly like this. So it's uh, omega times spectral density times some cotangents, hyperbolic cotangents function. And now we can simply say that, okay, let us assume actually that our environment is at zero temperature, but it actually it has a different spectral density. Namely, the spectral density is not just this function J, but it's this entire expression here. And if we do this, we know that we get exactly the same dynamics now from a, that we, I'm sorry, we can either have a environment with spectral density J and finite temperature T, or we take an environment with spectral density J beta and zero temperature. And this is, of course, very, very fortunate for us because the zero temperature result we can do very, very efficiently with these uh, matrix broad state simulations. And so that's exactly what we are doing uh, nowadays in simulations. And now I would like to show you what this makes possible. Um, so we are actually interested now in really doing simulations of biological complexes where um, we, we really want to take account of the full spectral density of the system. So we will not merely make um, an approximation maybe of the low energy parts of the um, spectral density, but we will really take into account the entire spectral density, including high frequency peaks, that might even couple, that might be very strongly detuned, but have a sizable von Ries factor and therefore may still couple to the electronic duties of freedom. And uh, we have now done this relatively recently that we compared these simulations of the exact spectral density in the black with actually simulations that you would do where you smooth out this high frequency part of the uh, spectral density and replace it by some smooth uh, curve uh, in, in, that is shown here in, in blue. And we were interested as to whether this approximation actually makes a significant difference on electronic properties of a system. So we were interested in this and we looked at uh, example systems. So like WSCP, which is a particular um, molecular uh, complex. And we did these calculations. And it turns out that although the electronic degrees of freedom are really resonant with, with the vibrational modes in this part of the spectrum and far off resonant with these ones. Nevertheless, taking into account the full spectral density with all its structure does make a significant difference in the prediction, for example, of experimental absorption spectra. So if you, um, if you are taking the um, the exact absorption spectrum, um, and you compare it to the one that you find uh, with the smoothed out um, uh, spectral density, you will see that there's actually a significant difference in what you observe 
um, in the numerical simulation. So really wings of the, numer of the absorption spectrum are completely missing when you smooth out the spectral density too much or when you ignore these high frequency parts. And you can check this also by the simulations, taking into account different numbers of these high frequency modes. And then you will see that gradually actually the correct spectrum act really emerges. And this might look like a, a maybe a minor effect, I mean, predicting some wings of a spectral density. But really important is that these spectral densities are being also used to infer back the electronic coupling strength between the uh, electronic degrees of freedom in this system. And if you're getting the absorption spectrum not correct, then you actually make wrong inferences of your, spec of your electronic coupling strengths. And actually it turns out that by doing this right or wrong, um, so by taking into account the full spectral density or the smoothed out version of the spectral density, you will see that your, your prediction of the electronic coupling strengths in the system can actually change by a factor of two. Although we are talking here of far resonant far off resonant modes. So this is an important conclusion to, that we draw from this because there's a lot of discussion uh, regarding the um, nature of coherencies in ultrafast spectroscopy in such systems and the observation of long-lived oscillatory signals in these spectra. And the interpretation of those spectra depends very str strongly on the electronic coupling strength that you ascribe to these uh, electronic degrees of freedom. If you say it is the, the coupling strength is this, then the nature of the oscillations which will be much more strongly in the vibrational regime, while if the coupling strength is, much, is twice as strong, you already have a much stronger vibronic contribution to these um, oscillations. And that uh, is really important to understand um, to be able to understand really the physical origin of these long-lived oscillations. So I suspect that I'm coming close to the end of my allotted time. Um, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, if you want a question, then we should wrap up now, basically. Yeah, okay. So then I would skip the second. Uh, so, I mean, maybe I should say that these methods now also allow us to compute actually even 2D spectra. Um, with these numerical exact methods. Um, and that is some work that we will hopefully publish uh, soon. So, I mean, certainly now we are able to, to really compare very detailed theory with experimental results. And so with that, I mean, I will leave out the, the rest of this is a different method. I can leave this, leave that out completely. And I can basically come to the conclusion. So our goal here is to find methods that are numerically exact for which we have kind of convergence guarantees from analytical methods in order to treat biomolecular systems or quantum effects in biomolecular systems as rigorously as possible and therefore unveil really the true physical origin of quantum dynamics in these systems. And I should like to thank um, the funders uh, that support this research and also the team um, that is working here at Ulm, and in particular, I would also like to highlight the role of uh, Jamie Lim, who is um, team leader here and who really leads a lot of this research. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this was, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, we don't really have time for questions, but I'll just ask one question, okay? Yeah. Um, can you comment about how do you, in, can you capture uh, disorder, okay, in this kind of system. Uh, I mean, if you do single molecule experiments, oftentimes you find that there isn't just, okay, one absorption spectra, the, the individual molecules have different ones. So there's an ensemble of Hamiltonians of the type that you are describing. Yeah, so in that, say, in that case, we would have to do what most numerical methods would have to do. We would have to sample over the disorder. And so repeat the simulations uh, several times. So for example, if the electronic parameters are so unknown to fluctuate, then we would have to repeat that. And this is what we actually did also for the calculations of the absorption spectra and so on, because now the method is very fast. So we can actually do these kind of things. Um, How fast is it? 
Hmm? Sorry? How fast is it? Okay, so now we have to we have to go into real numbers, but I mean, let's say in the end uh, for a single shot, uh, so that means for a particular electronic configuration and one environment, um, it took maybe a, a, a few seconds to, uh, few, up to maybe a minute or so to calculate the absorption spectrum. And then we had to sample, um, of course, and then we, we do this in parallel. So it's not really a huge um, extra effort. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to move to the next talk uh, by Xiang Shi. Yeah, uh, first uh, I would like to thank Sagi and Aitan for organizing this online workshop. And uh, today I'm going to talk about some of our recent works on the uh, generalized, uh, actually generalized mass equations, uh, how we can obtain the exact memory kernels and do some uh, really high order perturbative uh, expansion of these memory kernels. Uh, so our group has been working on quantum dynamics in condensed phases, uh, which uh, uh, some are related to today's talk, like this uh, uh, charge carrier transport uh, problem. Uh, this is the outline of the talk, and uh, I'll uh, start from the uh, nakajima Jimanzig mori generalized mass equation, which David talked about, and uh, I could save some time on this. Then I will go to uh, several model systems. For the spin model problem, I will present how we do the high order uh, perturbative kernel and so that uh, we can actually uh, uh, find a, a high order uh, rate constant beyond the uh, fermi scott rule. Uh, when applying this approach to the uh, charge carrier transport problem in, in a one dimensional, uh, actually hosting like a uh, model, like uh, David uh, Reckman has just talked about, uh, and some findings for the both the exact kernels and the perturbative kernels. Uh, and we also apply this to uh, uh, charge carrier transport in the model molecule junctions. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is the, uh, the Nakajiba and Stevensic Mori uh, uh, generalized mass equation, which is uh, uh, the one with the time uh, convolution kernel. Uh, so uh, there's a, the expression for these, uh, these kernels. So this is the inhomogeneous term. Uh, the term here is actually the, the formal exact equation for the mem for the for the memory kernel uh, actually uh, we have a, uh, in our model system we have do some we can do some further simplifications we choose a, a proper projection operator so in some cases we can get rid of the inhomogeneous term and uh, uh, and this is actually the, the working equation we used in all the three works uh, I will present today. Uh, as David uh, has shown, there's another form with, which is the time convolutionist uh, GME. If I have time, I, I will also uh, briefly show off some of our, our work on this TCL uh, generous mass equation. Uh, actually, I worked on this uh, uh, mass equation a long time ago with with uh, Aitan. Uh, it's almost twenty years ago. Uh, in that case, we want to find a way to uh, to calculate a, a, a short time kernel, uh, both uh, maybe uh, exactly or or approximately. And uh, uh, we have used derived a uh, integral equation for for the for the kernel. Uh, we can see that if you want to calculate the kernel directly, you have a projection operator in your in your propagate, which uh, is very difficult to do. So uh, we find this uh, Dyson type uh, relation. Uh, we can observe the exact kernel with, with two uh, auxiliary kernels, we, which we call Q1 and Q3. Uh, 
This K1 and K3 does not involve projectors uh, in the propagator. So uh, it still need a, a short time uh, propagation method, which can be uh, exact or approximate, but uh, it's much easier uh, to work with than the original, uh, original kernel. So over the past years, uh, we uh, both, uh, both our group and the other people has used uh, this, uh, this equation to calculate uh, the memory kernels. Uh, and I, I also want to uh, note that there's other ways to calculate the exact kernels without using the K1 and, and the K3. Uh, like Jian Shu Sao has this uh, transport tensor method and uh, Yijin Yan also uh, derived a method to, to use direct proje projection method using hierarchical equation motion to calculate the uh, exact kernel. Uh, so uh, the short time propagator we use is the hierarchical equation motion method, which I won't go into detail. It starts from the uh, caldera lagged time uh, Hamiltonian and uh, by uh, expansion of the bus, uh, bus correlation function, it can can arrive at a very high dimensional uh, differential equation for these uh, reduced uh, dynamics. So these are some recent uh, uh, numerical approach to, to solve this efficiently. Uh, and and the, in recent years, uh, it has found a, a lot of applications. So uh, I go to the, the first application of, of the, uh, the general mass equations with the exact kernel. Uh, the first example is a, a spin boson problem, which uh, I, I, I think this audience is, is very familiar with this. I want to go into details. Uh, so the projection operator we use is kind, kind of this uh, diagonal term uh, uh, times this, this equi uh, relaxed uh, equilibrium. So what we get is actually um, a general mass equation rather than a general quantum mass equation, uh, which has only the population term. Uh, so uh, this K1 and K3 uh, can be calcul calculated this way, which uh, you just put in the, it in the hierarchical equation motion and, and you can uh, obtain these kernels. So uh, here's the result. We can see that uh, uh, the, the general mass equation actually works. And when compared with the second order, uh, perturbation setting of the kernel, uh, you can see that there's difference both in the kernel and, and the dynamics. Uh, then the next uh, thing we want to do is, is to, to obtain the high order expansion of, of the kernel. So there's uh, uh, analytical expressions for, for these kernels. Uh, they, can, they can be right uh, this way using the project operators. Uh, the real challenge in calculating these, uh, these high order terms is actually you need to, to do a, a, a very large high dimensional integrals. Uh, currently, uh, to, to, the, to our knowledge, the largest order is, is six order uh, performed by Jian Wu and, and, and Jian Shu Cao. Uh, we actually uh, think about it. So uh, we can use this Stetson type uh, relation and they ex expanded the kernel P1 and K3. And we can actually uh, using this method to, to find out uh, the, uh, the high order expansion to, um, kernel uh, using this relation. It's actually uh, calculated with the expansion of K1 and K3. Uh, the K1 and K3 uh, are also uh, can be obtained uh, using the pass integral form. Uh, like has, has been shown by Tony Laguette uh, many years ago. Uh, since we have a passing integral expression, we can also uh, using the same method to, to derive the hierarchical equilibrium motion to uh, derive the, the high order expansion of, of, of the uh, reduced stances operator uh, into the, uh, these uh, high order Terms of, of, of coupling. So we actually uh, extended the HUI method to do the high order expansion, which uh, gives a structure looks like this. 
So uh, this is actually the normal hierarchical e e equation like method. So uh, this dimension, you have these uh, auxiliary density uh, operators. But in the other dimension is uh, your participative expansion dimension. So uh, the high order uh, are affected by the low order terms, but the low order terms are not effect affected by the high order terms. So we can actually do this. So uh, like uh, like in the uh, in a, a spin bottom model in the uh, coherent regime, we can actually do uh, very high order perturbation of, of the of the dynamics, not not the kernel yet. So we can say uh, uh, that uh, then we use the the uh, perturbative K one three get the high order perturbation terms, which we can say that. Uh, uh, these these are uh, uh, second order and and fourth and sixth order. We can see that uh, participative uh, kernels actually works uh, in in this uh, uh, rich regime and uh, works well in this rich regime, not very well in this uh, uh, coherence dynamics regime, uh, which actually uh, uh, these these are, are different parameters uh, which. Also indicates the uh, high order expansion of the kernel works better for for fast pass, which is consistent with uh, the range of validity of the NIBA. So uh, I want to skip this, and uh, uh, we can also use uh, the the perturbative kernel to access some uh, memory uh, uh, resummation techniques for memory kernels. We can also compare with uh, uh, the Pate type or, or lambda zero type uh, resummation techniques. So uh, this, uh, yeah, we can say that uh, some of them actually works uh, quite well, both uh, like high temperature, fast pass, and the read dynamics regime, uh, which I won't go into details. And uh, we can actually show that uh, using this high order kernel, we can obtain the uh, high order rate constant. As we know, both the max rate and the uh, Fermi's Gordon rule are actually second order perturbation. If you want to go to a, a high order rate, rate constant, uh, what will uh, be it like? We can see in this figure that the Fermi's Gordon rule actually overestimates the uh, rate constant uh, significantly when the uh, reorganized energy is, is not very large. So uh, we just uh, take the uh, Marconi approximation in the generalized mass equation to define rate constant. Uh, in this way, we can both get the exact rate constant and the high order perturbative rate constant. Uh, the results are, are, are looks like this. So we can see that uh, the second order perturbation OS miss rate constant and uh, the fourth, uh, you add the fourth order, it, it underestimates, and you have this uh, uh, oscillatory uh, uh, scenario, which actually uh, converts uh, quite slowly. Uh, you can also use the per day approximation and the lambda zero approximation uh, for the uh, resummation method. We can act actually say that. These two methods actually uh, works reasonable for for faster convergence of the rate constants. Uh, in the next uh, application, we use this for the for the charge carrier transporting a model system. This is a uh, of great interest in the field of uh, of uh, uh, organic molecule crystals. In in this uh, field. People have some uh, long history of uh, arguments whether these charge carrier transports are band like or hopping like. Actually, uh, these experiments say both behaviors. Uh, for, for example, in this nef nephthalene crystal, in some directions, you see the mob mobility and the temperature based on a, a power law. So, in this case, uh, it's a typical bandit transport uh, behavior. 
but in another direction, you see the almost uh, independence of the mobility uh, with res respect to the temperature, which is uh, also another indication that in this direction, the transport may be, may be a helping mechanism. Uh, so we use uh, uh, model Hamtoni. Actually, uh, this one is uh, 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 simplified version of the uh, hosting Paris model. It's actually a Paris model. It's not a, a hosting model. Uh, the difference is that the fluctuation uh, is in the in uh, uh, this is the hosting model is the fluctuation is in the diagonal term. But the Paris term actually cause fluctuations in the in the coupling in the alpha diagonal term of the tight bonding Hamiltonian. Uh, we actually worked on on, on either the Paris and the hosting. I think uh, uh, previously people had using a different uh, approximation to to solve this problem, uh, and the most most of them depends on some kind of second order perturbation, uh, but the uh, using a non perturbative method like uh, HVM, you can you can achieve a non perturbative ca calculation, which gives a correct uh, equilibrium, which is not the case for some uh, like the Huckins Jovo method, which actually uh, since it's a, a stochastic lower equation, it, it does not give the correct uh, equilibrium. And then it does not have to take the uh, white noise approximation. Uh, so uh, this is a very uh, early work, it's a, a more than 10 years ago. In actually, our simulation has shown that uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, depends on the, on the uh, intermolecular coupling, uh, you can actually re re reproduce the, uh, the band like behavior and, and hopping behavior. Uh, and the, uh, later, we want to use the uh, general mass equation method to uh, uh, to uh, to understand the transport. Actually, this method has 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 been used before, but previously people use uh, appro approximate kernels, and here we can actually calculate the, uh, the exact kernels for this problem. Uh, so it can be shown that the the, the mass equation actually works well. Uh, when compared with the exact results, uh, and we can uh, actually show these uh, these uh, uh, nearest neighbor uh, kernel. We can see that uh, this uh, purple line is actually a second order uh, kernel. But uh, when you increase the coupling, uh, this is the, the normalized kernel. We can see that more complex structures uh, appears for for the exact kernel. Besides the nearest neighbor kernel, kernel which uh, is uh, because the coupling is the nearest neighbor, the second order only uh, predicts the nearest neighbor kernel uh, because other terms are, are all zero. Uh, but uh, if you obtain the exact kernel, you can actually uh, obtain uh, uh, the, the, the kernel, memory kernel for, for larger distance. Uh, in that way, we can see that uh, this one three and one four and one five. If you increase the uh, coupling further, you, you can see uh, uh, the kernel for, for, for longer distance can uh, also appear. Uh, we can also make a, a Markian approximation, get a, a mass equation, a poly mass equation. So these are actually read constants. Uh, since it's a one-dimensional model, we can also calculate the uh, diffusion constant with these uh, read constants. Uh, the question is, uh, does the uh, uh, Markovian approx approximation work uh, in finding the diffusion constants? We can actually uh, compare the Markovian uh, diffusion constant with the uh, uh, exact uh, diffusion constant. Actually, we find out the uh, long-time diffusive behavior is, is really correctly captured. Uh, we can then investigate uh, the different hopping rates, uh, how the different hopping rates affect the, uh, the different constant. We can uh, see that, that uh, uh, the, the transport uh, di distance and the, uh, the y-axis is, uh, is risk constant. It actually drops. When you increase coupling, uh, it, it has a contributions from uh, uh, longer distance. 
uh, actually it did have a, a effect uh, on, on the different content because uh, the, the different content has the T straight uh, times the square of, of the transfer distance. Uh, so we can actually also compare the second order and the fourth order race. Uh, we can say that the, the second order race, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the radical actually overestimates the, the real second order, the real nearest neighbor race. Uh, actually, uh, for a larger coupling constant, the, the difference might be an order of magnitude. Uh, but if you put the, the first order correction, uh, actually the first order is negative. So uh, in some case, uh, it in, improves, but, but, but if you increase the uh, coupling further, it actually breaks because uh, you will get a negative rate. Uh, for your rate constant, but for the for the next nearest neighbor contribution, the, the fourth order also actually uh, this is fourth order. The, the radical is fourth order because the second order is, is zero, so it also overestimates uh, the the rate constant. Uh, but if you uh, put the whole thing together to get a, a diffusion constant, you can actually say that. Uh, Although the, the second order overestimates the rate constant, uh, this, this black curve is the exact one. The difference is only a factor of two or something. It's actually a constellation of error because the, the second order overestimates the nearest neighbor, but under, underestimates the, the longer distance uh, uh, transfer rates. So there's a constellation error in, in this formula, uh, which shows that uh, the second order uh, perturbation may not be very bad in calculating the, the diffusion diff constants. Uh, then we, uh, we also uh, investigated the problem of the molecular junctions, the charge carrier transport uh, through these, these, the two electrode tools. And, uh, uh, and and the molecule is, is rep represents uh, by a one orbital uh, two uh, two spin model, which gives uh, four states in in the middle. Uh, this has been investigated uh, by uh, a lot of people, uh, especially um, Guy Kong has de derived a, a, a current a current uh, expression for this because. Uh, if you apply the mass equation directly, it can only give you uh, the population or the density of It does not tell you anything about the current. Uh, Cohen and Rabani actually uh, devised a method to calculate the current uh, there. Uh, we use a, a slightly different uh, uh, operator to calculate the, the current. I think they use the current operator, where we use the, the particle number operator in deriving the uh, ex expression for the current. Uh, the difference is that uh, our current is actually uh, um, uh, a, a convolution with a new kernel with the population. Uh, where what they get is, is the time derivative of the current, and the, in our case, is, is the current. Uh, the how to calculate this, this new current, we, we also ob obtain a similar relation as for the population dynamics, uh, we, which we call the Kn1 and the Kn3. Uh, both of them can be calculated in the hierarchical equation method. So uh, this is our working equation. So this is, uh, uh, is uh, essentially the same as before, but this one is uh, the new ex expression to calculate the current. Uh, this shows that uh, the method actually works for the population dynamics, and uh, uh, this is the kernel uh, for the currents and the, uh, and the and this currents. And the, we can also do perturbative ex expansion of, of, of both population and the uh, current. And we can say that uh, in a simple case uh, where, where there's no coolant in interaction, uh, uh, we can capture the steady state current as a function of the system bus coupling strength. Uh, we can see the, uh, 
the HVM result and the, the, the exact kernel. And the, the perturbative kernel also shows this behavior that it's uh, uh, actually very easy to diverge uh, as uh, uh, David has shown in, in his talk. So uh, uh, here's some uh, more details of the, the expansions, which I want to go into detail. And uh, I uh, should use uh, the final uh, several minutes uh, talking about the time convolutionist uh, generalized mass equation. Uh, uh, this is a formal uh, ex expression for, for this, but uh, we use a slightly different uh, method, which is uh, uh, we just uh, find the, the transfer matrix and the, uh, use the EC inverse and, 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 and to get this. So it's actually uh, uh, assumes that uh, this uh, is obtained by, uh, by this uh, uh, transfer matrix, which is start from different initial conditions uh, and, and the gases. Uh, this method, uh, uh, we use this method uh, also more than more than ten years ago, and uh, uh, Giovanni has also worked uh, using this. We can also do uh, uh, high order expansion for these uh, uh, transform matrix and also this uh, uh, time uh, convolution kernel. So here's the results. So uh, it's actually for the spin bottom. We can see that. Uh, we can actually uh, also, uh, in some cases, can the converge results. We can see both see the uh, population and, and the kernel. Uh, and uh, sometimes it, uh, it also diverges. Uh, also, another problem uh, caused with this uh, time convolution method is actually uh, sing singularities, because in, in some time, uh, uh, there's singularity in this is basically the cross of, of these, these two curves, you get singularity. This singularity is actually quite severe for the, for the multi-level system like, like this FMO case, because there's many uh, different en energy levels and uh, it may be quite severe. So uh, here's the summary. So we can actually present the exact memory curves and the, the uh, their perturbation, we apply this to mean several problems like a high order risk constants and the uh, charge carrier transport and the uh, molecular junctions. And uh, uh, these are the people doing the work and these uh, are the funding agencies. And uh, thanks, thank you for your attention. Thank you. So we have uh, time for a few questions. I don't see anything in the chat. Anybody want to? I have a question. Yeah. Chang, that was a nice talk. This is David Reichman. I, I have a question about the uh, charge transport. So in your talk, you mentioned you can study this in an exact way with both the pyrroles and the Holstein coupling together. And my question is, there's been some recent work, but it, it does not use exact methods, which makes physical arguments that seem reasonable that uh, even if the Holstein coupling is large, uh, the effect on the mobility is always dominated by the pyrroles coupling. So that even if the Holstein coupling is larger than the pyrroles coupling, if you were to calculate the, uh, let's say the current current correlation function, the frequency dependence of the current current correlation function is very much uh, depends on the Holstein coupling at high frequency. But at zero frequency, which gives you the mobility, it's really always the pyrroles coupling that dominates. Do you find that this is true? If you studied um, when what happens when you take a system and you remove the pyrroles coupling and just have the Holstein, or you remove the Holstein and just have the pyrroles to see which is more important for transport? Uh, it, it, it actually depends on what kind of parameter you use. Actually, uh, if you... I think in these works, they have some uh, uh, assumptions about the different uh, skills uh, of uh, either the, uh, yeah. actually we haven't, we haven't do this simultaneously, but uh, uh, this one is actually the, uh, the, the pairs. So, so this code is, is, is pairs case. So it, it depends on the, 
there's a constant uh, in in this uh, uh, this constant j, which is uh, is uh, the uh, the one without the fluctuations, and uh, this actually we found that actually uh, impacts the dynamics. If you the if you uh, the the coupling is large, it, it shows this uh, uh, bandwidth uh, behavior because uh, your fluctuations actually cause decoherence. But when when the when the coupling is small. The fluctuations actually dominates. It actually facilitates uh, your transport. I think uh, uh, it actually shows the the pair term. Uh, the actually uh, the, the effect of the pair term is different uh, for mm -hmm. uh, in different par parameter regimes. Thanks. I have a question too, maybe. Uh, so you. What I understand, you are using the hierarchical equation of motion method to calculate the exact kernels, and you yes. are using yeah. different projection operators that will change the kernel. Okay, uh, can you comment on uh, when is it advantageous to actually use the kernel as opposed to direct dynamics from the hierarchical equation of motions when you choose different projections? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you can use the hierarchical equation of motion to do the dynamics directly, right? Yeah, so, but, but we, we, we sometimes we try to understand uh, uh, what, what's behind the simulation results. Like, uh, uh, so uh, like in, in the first case, we want to calculate the high order rate constants. In, in, in that case, uh, we need to obtain the, the high order kernel first and, and say that uh, we, which term contri contributes uh, uh, more sig significantly. Uh, to the to the correction to the second order, and in the in the uh, and in the charge uh, charge carrier transport case, we want to uh, understand whether the, the nearest neighbor or or, or long distance uh, 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 transport dominates the the uh, diffusion constant. In that case. Uh, I think you cannot get so sets directly from the hierarchical motion. So you need you we need to uh, get to the uh, kernel first and and, and then get the uh, transfer risk constant and the, the contributions. Okay, but isn't it true that if you use projection operator that only projects to the populations as opposed to the full density matrix, you are going to get different memory times, for example. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. And then so, yeah. different rate constants in a sense, I guess. Uh, rate constant. Uh, I, I think I think if you use the full uh, density matrix, it's probably not easy to to define a rate constant in in that case. If you use a population, it's probably well, much easier to define. No, I understand this, but you will have population to population. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I interrupt? It's uh, 1240. Why don't we um, uh, conclude the formal uh, workshop? So I'm going to stop recording. Uh, thank you all. And